Looks like participants are entering. That's great. And recording is on. Excellent. Okay. I'll wait until the number sort of flattens out. All right, well, it looks like we're close to 100 participants, which is wonderful. Oh, and it's still increasing, which is great. Okay, well, I'll get started and then, um, yeah, because I just have some ground rules to lay out. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on your time zone. This is your host, Danielle Sumi, speaking from the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology headquarters in Washington, DC. IRIS and UNAVCO are consortiums of universities that operate the SAGE and GAGE NSF-funded science facilities in geophysics. Webinars are recorded and archived on the IRIS Earthquake Science YouTube channel. Welcome to the first of two virtual GAGE SAGE plenary sessions. The plenary session is Behavior at and Coupling Across Key Earth Interfaces. Today's session is presented by Dr. Heather Ford from the University of California, Riverside, and Dr. Diego Melgar from the University of Oregon. The in-person Gage Sage Science Workshop was postponed from August 2020 to August 2021. In the meantime, several of the planned speakers are presenting in this webinar series so we can learn more about these subjects before next year. The webinar ground rules for today's call are only the presenters and I will speak. If you have a comment or question as the webinar unfolds, then please clearly and concisely type it into the Q&A box, so not the chat box, but the Q&A box. We will have time for questions after each speaker, so just a few minutes after each speaker. I will read your question to the speaker. If similar questions are asked in the Q&A box, I may combine or skip them. Heather and Diego will also have a chance to comment in written text if needed, uh, just to add more clarification. If the webinar crashes, just click the link you received by email. Um, I will also place a short five minute survey in the chat box itself. Um, your opinions and insight will help us to inform future webinars. One of the questions we'll ask if you're watching this remotely, um, maybe in groups using the same link, maybe not right now because of COVID, but if it's more than just you, please let me know. Our first presenter today is Dr. Heather Ford, an assistant professor of geology in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of California, Riverside. Her research focuses on better understanding the properties, structure and dynamics of the Earth through the use of seismic imaging methods namely receiver function analysis and shear wave splitting. So without further ado, here's Dr. Ford to talk about the seismic signature of past and present tectonic and dynamic processes on the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. Thanks, Heather. Yep. Uh, thank you, Danielle. And, and just for any reason, if it seems like my internet connection is getting wonky, uh, let me know just because it seems like every day it's, it's something new. Um, and before I begin, I'd just like to say, um, you know, thank you to the, the individuals who are holding, pulling this together, Danielle and John and everybody else. Um, you know, like many people, I was very sad that the, the Gage and Sage meeting was canceled this year because of coronavirus. And I'm hoping that things will go back to normal in the not too distant future so that we can meet and learn about all the great science that everyone's doing. I'd also like to give a, a quick shout out to um, Brown University, Yale and UCR, which have all supported me along my, my path. And, um, are places where I've done a lot of the work that I'll be talking about today. And then uh, along with that, I'd also like to thank uh, IRIS and SCEC um, for being facilities that have provided access to the, the troves of data that I've used in my research in this talk and then in others. And then NSF for supporting facilities like IRIS and SCEC and now SAGE and GAGE and whatever facility um, we happen to call ourselves in the future. Um, so the, the bulk of today's talk is going to be focused on uh, the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, um, I'll call it the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, I might call it the LAB. Um, I might use the term lithospheric thickness to sort of be a proxy for that as well. And the focus is going to be through kind of an oblique lens looking at how the LAB changes in the, uh, in the event that different tectonic or dynamic processes 
um, modified. And so we'll start by providing very basic definition of what the LAB is and then work up to a more nuanced definition before diving into specific case studies. Oh, I can't, there we go. Um, so the lithosphere sinister boundary um, in the very classic introductory sense is the uh, portion of the Earth's crust and uppermost mantle that behaves as a uh, solid rigid plate um, that floats on top of the Earth's convecting mantle as seen as sphere. And so this is the definition I provide to my uh, introductory geology students. When we start to think about it more carefully, um, we start to unravel layers of additional complexity when trying to define the lithosphere and the asthenosphere and the boundary between the two. And so um, this figure on the right comes from a review paper uh, by Karin Fisher and others looking at the LAB and the, the properties of it. And so for many of us, the kind of primary definition of what differentiates the lithosphere from the asthenosphere is the mode by which heat is transmitted. And so in the lithosphere, um, which is cooler, and this is sort of a very cartoonish uh, geotherm of the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary system, um, heat in the lithosphere is conducted, um, whereas heat within the mantle asthenosphere is transmitted convectively. And so the lithosphere is also cooler than the mantle asthenosphere, um, which provides the contrast and mechanical properties that we talk about why the lithosphere is rigid, whereas the asthenosphere um, is more uh, ab able to flow. Um, when we look at seismic velocities, we see a, a drop in velocity as we transition from the cooler high velocity lid into the convecting mantle asthenosphere, which is hotter and seismically slower. But as it turns out, when we look at actual seismic velocities across the planet at the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary, we find that a lot of times we cannot explain the seismic variations through a mechanism such as temperature on its own. And that in many instances, we have to invoke a uh, kind of difference in uh, either water content with the lithosphere being drier than the underlying asthenosphere or the potential for possibly uh, partial melt located within the asthenosphere. As it turns out, not only is there nuance in how we define the lithosphere and the asthenosphere in terms of physical properties, but the methods that we use to define and image the LAB um, vary as well. And so I mentioned seismic velocities decreasing from the lithosphere to the asthenosphere. Um, but we also have cases where we have um, changes in the seismic anisotropy or um, in the electrical resistivity where the lithosphere is typically more resistive than the underlying asthenosphere, which is more conduct or conductive. Uh, and we have uh, changes in heat flow between um, places with thicker lithosphere and thinner lith versus thinner lithosphere. And then finally, there are geochemical and petrological differences in the types of xenoliths that we see coming from lithospheric versus asthenospheric depths. And so what we have is a, a very complex boundary, um, not one clear cut definition. Um, we have various definitions depending in part on the imaging methods and techniques, um, and also based uh, regionally, as it turns out. And so a, uh, a really key observation that we've made regarding lithospheric thickness is that it increases with age. And we see this really nicely um, in the ocean basins where the thinnest lithosphere, and this is a, a plot showing us uh, seismic velocities. Um, this is the location of the mid-ocean ridge where we see the seismic velocities getting faster um, to greater depths indicates that the lithosphere is thickening. And so in the oceans, we know that the thinnest lithosphere is located at the mid-ocean ridges and the thickest lithos lithosphere is located near subduction zones and regions where we have older lithosphere. And so that's a really clear cut correlation. And we see a slightly messier, but still pretty well established correlation in the continents as well. And so on the right, we have a tomography model with a depth slice at 110 kilometers. The blue cor colors correspond to higher wave speeds, seismic wave speeds, um, the red slower. And what we see are the highest wave speeds. And those are the wave speeds that correspond to lithospheric mantle are located beneath the cratons and places where we have thinner lithosphere or we're presently in the asthenosphere, we see the redder colors. And so you see the reddest of the reds, so the slowest mantle at the mid-ocean ridges where we know we are clearly in the asthenosphere. We see the coldest colors and the highest wave speeds beneath the cratons. Where deviations from this correlation exist, we often find um, 
other processes at play. And so a really good example, this is the Wyoming Craton. We have another tomography model with various depth slices. The blues are again fast, the reds are again slow. And we should expect to see blues across this entire image. But what we see, we see reds. We see reds on the western margin. We see some reds on the eastern margin as we increase in depth. And so what this tells us is that the lithosphere is actually not thick everywhere beneath the craton like it should be. And in fact, what we have is we have evidence for lithospheric loss. And this would correspond to a thinner lithosphere atmosphere boundary or shallower one. Um, and that we think that this can be explained by a combination of processes, including um, deformation during the layer mitorogeny, and then the recent impingement of the Yellowstone plume on the craton. And so this might tell us something about other processes. Um, we also are interested in studying the LAB so we can better understand the physical properties of um, both the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. And I mentioned this in the earlier slides, but this is really important when we are trying to understand whether temperature, melt, uh, water are playing a role in what these viscosities might be. This has important implications from processes ranging from subduction to um, post seismic deformation and relaxation. Today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend the remainder of the talk talking about um, variations of the LAB and what that might be telling us about different tectonic processes in two places. The first is on the western margin um, between the North America and the Pacific plates. And then I'm going to briefly jump over to the eastern margin of North America and talk about uh, more recent work that we're doing there where we have some really interesting results. To uh, kind of give you a primer on how I look at the lithosphere sensor boundary, how I image it, I use something called S2P receiver function analysis. And this is a technique where we have incoming um, teleseismic S waves that encounter a boundary in velocity. And so this is just a, a cartoon. And once these waves encounter a boundary, some of the energy is converted to a P wave and some of it remains an S wave. When the two waves arrive at the station, we can actually difference them out um, and use a, a, a deconvolution technique in order to um, get a, an impedance series that tells us something about um, structure at depth. And so I, when I have a little bit of data, we just do a single station stacking technique. But when we have a lot of data, a lot of stations closely spaced, we can actually use a common conversion point and stacking technique, which will give us a three-dimensional image of structure um, with depth. And so this was a study done in 2014, looking at the, the structure of the LAB in Western North America, uh, focusing on uh, the plate boundary. And so all of the red dots in this left-hand figure are seismic stations used in the study. Uh, what we did is we then took um, all of the corresponding receiver functions and we stacked them to generate these volume images. And this is an example of a uh, profile image of this, this uh, final product. And so in the figures that I'm going to show in this part of the talk, the blue colors correspond to a velocity decrease with depth. And so this is a little bit different than the tomography model. So what we're imaging is we're imaging an interface. Okay, and this interface in this case is going to be the lithosphere asthenosphere boundary. And the reason that it's not just a single discrete line like I kind of showed in some of those earlier cartoons is because we're dealing with uh, finite frequencies and the, the, the teleseismic waves that are coming up to the stations we're filtering. And we also believe that these uh, boundaries are not just discrete step functions, but rather they are a, a gradient in velocity. And so what we see here in this example, this is just a profile kind of taken from the northern part of California through the southern part, kind of running along the edge of the Central Valley in Sierra. And we see our negative phase. It's colored in blue, um, which we interpret to be the lithosphere sinusphere boundary. Now I've talked a lot about the depth of the LAB. I haven't said a lot about um, the amplitude of the negative phases that we're looking at. And so the color blue has a kind of a range of, of bluenesses. And so the darker the blue, the larger the amplitude. Um, the weaker the blue, um, the smaller the amplitude. And th these amplitude variations are actually really important. And they are kind of the, the main part of the story that I'm going to share with you. Um, and that's because the amplitude is a function of two things. It's a function of the change in velocity from the lithosphere to the asthenosphere. And it's also uh, a function of the gradient thickness. So how rapidly do you change from lithosphere to asthenosphere? So this helps us to better understand those physical properties, those changes in properties that I was talking about earlier. And so the, the really kind of take home message from the study, and I'm kind of giving you the punchline at the beginning, is that the real story isn't in 
the changes in depth of the LAB in this particular area. Now there might be there might be story there, um, but the the real kind of ah wow that's a really cool observation is from the variations in amplitude across a study area. And what we observed, and it was surprising, was that there was a pronounced well-defined variation in the amplitude between portions of the study area that are on the North American plate versus portions that fall on the Pacific plate. You can see that in this map on the bottom left where the blue colors correspond to smaller amplitudes and the reds and yellows correspond to larger amplitudes. And you can see we have these large amplitude LAB phases to the east. And then once you cross the plate boundary, they drop off considerably. And this is also shown really nicely in these two cross sections. So cross section one is the one I showed you before and cross section two is one that is uh, uh, boundary, plate boundary parallel, but on the Pacific plate side. And I, so I've labeled those North American plate and Pacific plate. What you notice is that LAB on the North American plate is continuous, it's homogeneous, it's large amplitude, it's very blue. On the bottom, the Pacific plate LAB is uh, highly heterogeneous. The depth changes quite a bit. Um, in some places it becomes very weak and hard to actually pick a, an LAB phase. Over here you can see we're really kind of digging to try to find anything that might resemble um, a negative phase. And so the, the take home message was LAB amplitudes on the Pacific plate are much weaker than on the North American plate. When we look at profiles perpendicular to the plate, we see the same, um, same observation where you have strong coherent negative phases to the east and a considerable drop off to the west. And that this is coincident with the surface expression of the San Andreas Fault. And so this is profile AA prime running through central California. And again, we see this clear drop off in amplitude to the west. Um, a little bit further to the north in cross section B to B prime, we see that the change in amplitude from well constrained large amplitude negative phase to really weak phases occurs um, in kind of the region between the uh, Hayward and Calaveras fault, which are part of the San Andreas fault system and the plate boundary more generally. And I'm going to have to leave out a lot of the kind of discussion part of this study, which is why is it that the Pacific plate and the North American plate have uh, kind of a very different LAB signature? Why are the amplitudes different? Um, is it because the gradient between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere is different between the Pacific plate and the asthenosphere and the North American plate and the asthenosphere? Or is it because the velocities of the lithosphere of those two plates is somehow fundamentally different? What I want to focus on instead is the, uh, the, the observation that the transition in properties of the LAB is abrupt. It occurs over distances of less than 50 kilometers, and that's when we take into the sort of resolving power of S to P receiver functions. And what this implies is that there is a shear zone that remains relatively narrow to the base of the lithosphere. And this has important implications for understanding of transform plate boundaries more general and how deformation is accommodated within the mantle lithosphere. And so we have kind of two different MMR models here, one in which deformation within the mantle lithosphere is accommodated over a broad zone of hundreds of kilometers, and that we only see these discrete deformation zones at the surface where we have brittle deformation. Um, or we have the other end member where we have this well-defined zone of narrow deformation um, between two plates that are moving past each other laterally. And what our uh, study shows is that this model right here agrees well with what we observe from STP receiver functions. I'm now going to switch gears, um, jumping very quickly, the quickest transcontinental flight in history from the west coast over to the eastern margin of North America to look at variations in lithospheric thickness in the LAB um, in New England. To give you just a very brief primer on the tectonic history of the New England and Appalachian areas, um, we have a kind of core part of North America um, called Laurentia that was stabilized at about a billion years ago. Um, and then since then, um, Eastern North America has undergone two complete Wilson cycles that are well, re well represented in the surface geology. And so this is a, an image from a, a GSA Today article kind of just very briefly summarizing that tectonic history. And what we have presently is we have terrains that were accreted onto the Eastern margin of North America building up what is now the margin of our continent. And so we have a, a, a rich complex history that we have to take into account when looking at the lithosphere boundary. In addition to that, we know that um, from present day seismic imaging 
that there is a well-defined seismically slow region beneath New England that doesn't have a surface manifestation, meaning that we have slow velocities that might indicate the presence of some sort of asthenospheric upwelling. But even if we have some sort of process to generate things such as melt, which could make their way to the surface, we don't have any evidence for it yet. So this is a, a young process, but it might be possible that it's affecting the LAB. People have looked at the lithosphere sinusoidal boundary in the past. This is a, an example from a continent-wide study using SP receiver function analysis, the same technique, um, very similar methods to what we um, use in this study. And what they observed is thinner than expected lithosphere beneath the eastern margin. Okay, um, so if you were to look at a tomography model, you might estimate in some cases, you know, maybe the eastern margin might be 100 kilometers. Nothing too impressive in one direction or another. But when you look at this cross section, which is C to C prime. In this map, you'll see that when we get into the Appalachian terrain, the LAB is very shallow. It's no shallower or thicker than um, or deeper than what we see on the western margin of the continent, and that the amplitudes are fairly large, suggesting that there is a, a well-defined boundary between the lithosphere and the asthenosphere here. We also know from PDS receiver function analysis that there is an abrupt and well-constrained step in crustal thickness from the Appalachian terrains in the east to Laurentia. And so this is seen well in this image right here, which is just a plot of the thickness or the depth of the Moho. And you see that the Moho um, is shallower beneath the kind of eastern half of uh, New England. And then as you walk or you kind of step over into um, Laurentia, the stable continental interior, we see a uh, crustal thickening. And this is also well shown in this profile right here which kind of runs uh, from New York down towards uh, the Cape uh, in Rhode Island area. This step in crustal thickness is uh, somewhat surprising given the age, um, but it's well constrained. And we see um, results that confirm this using more detailed data from a temporary deployment called SizeCon. Um, this is work done by Maureen Long and her students. And um, I don't have time to show any images from it, but it, it really hammers home this idea that we have a well-defined step between older Grenvillian and younger um, Appalachian terrains. Uh, since I only have a couple of minutes, I'm just gonna very briefly go through the, the observations that we have with um, the size con data in SAP receiver function analysis. This is just an image um, from A to A prime showing you what a typical receiver function uh, looks like for a CCP stack receiver function looks like for our, our study area. Um, the red is the MOHO in this case, the blue is the LAB. Um, this bottom plot is just showing you the ray path coverage where we have darker blues that tells us we have lots of crossing ray path coverage. Things are very well resolved. Green means things are not resolved well at all. And in some cases we'll actually kind of block it out entirely from our imaging. But it also means that in some places like this, I don't believe what we're seeing here. Um, it's, there's probably some structure but there are some, um, some effects due to the low density of, of ray paths that will make this more suspect. And so we're really gonna just look at the LAB for the remaining slides. Now the big observation we make with this study is that we see a pronounced variation in the uh, LAB phase between Grenvillian slash Laurentia terrain and the younger Appalachian terrains. And so uh, this is work done by my graduate student, Jillian Goldhagen. And it's kind of in this, the steps of we have all the, the results and we have sort of an interpretation of it. And now we're just going back and kind of crossing all of our T's and dotting our I's. Uh, starting with G to G prime, which is kind of south of the size con array, we see thicker, uh, well-defined, a uh, thicker lithosphere with a well-defined LAB. And then there's a sudden step. We see thinning and uh, overall, uh, you know, large drop in amplitude of the LAB. Um, she kind of marked that point right here. Um, this transition in geology from Laurentia to Appalachian terrains occurs right here between the brown and the green. Moving a little bit further to the north, um, F to F prime right along the size con array. Again, we see a strong, well-developed LAB phase at about 70 kilometers depth. And once we step to the east into the Appalachian terrains, that signal disappears entirely. And then um, an E to E prime, which is located further to the north of our study area, we still see this negative phase that we characterize as the LAB to the west. And then once again, once we cross from Grenvillian to um, Gander trains, we see a thinning of the lithosphere and a decrease in amplitude. And so she actually marked 
the locations of these transitions, um, the black dots corresponding to where this transition is gradual, the gray dots transition, where the transition goes from large amplitudes to no amplitudes, and this here where it goes from thicker to thinner. And what we see is there's a really good correspondence between the change in LAB character, whether it's the depth or the amplitude, and the, um, the boundary between, um, this is uh, Lawrence and Grenville terrains and Appalachian terrain. So this fits well with what we know from PDS receiver functions. And that tells us that not only is there a step in crustal thickness, but there appears to be a step in the thickness of the lithosphere or the LAB. Um, and so I've kind of modified the figure from uh, Lee et al to kind of incorporate our hypothesized lithosphere and showing that there is a, again a step in this lithospheric thickness from older terrains to younger terrains. And as I mentioned in my abstract that went around with the advertisement for, for this webinar, is that we actually have a lot of trouble trying to reconcile um, this observation with what we know about um, the evolution of the lithosphere your boundary, which is, you know, it is a, a boundary that is primarily controlled um, by thermal processes that we have colder conductive lithosphere on top of convective mantle at xenosphere, and that over time, the thickness of the lithosphere, sh lithosphere should increase. And so why we see this well-preserved step in the lithosphere, and despite millions of years of, of time for thermal processes to kick in, is actually quite surprising, um, particularly when you consider that not only do we have uh, two complete Wilson cycles, but we also have, uh, you know, a large, low, you know, wave speed seismic anomaly beneath New England that might also be um, affecting the lithosphere above it. And so that's as far as I can really get with this. I know I'm running out of time um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I think we have time for a quick question or two. Um, Tom Herring asks, is the depth of the LAB on the Pacific plate consistent with the plate age? Um, so that's a good question. I'm, so. I, Maybe if I can, I need to go back and maybe share my screen again. Um, let's see, I lost the Zoom share screen button. Um, so what we see with the Pacific in some instances is actually really hard to pick a depth for the LAB. Um, can you guys see the, the PowerPoint slide? Yeah. I'll try to zoom in a little bit. Okay, go. I don't want to like start the show again. Um, and I'm trying to move all the other windows. So um, this is a, a plot of the LAB depths. And, you know, we've seen some cases like, uh, you know, this uh, thinner um, bit of lithosphere right here, right next to the thicker bit, that's quite pronounced. Um, that was observed um, independently in an earlier study by uh, Ved Lickick. And we, it's thought that this is the, the result of more recent deformation as a result of the the plate boundary transitioning from one that's subduction to um, transform motion. So we get some, you know, the transverse ranges have um, moved to the north and rotated 90 degrees. So we get an opening here. Um, so that's pretty well constrained. That's not really consistent with what we think the thickness should be in terms of plate age, but that's explained by more recent tectonic processes. Um, these patches of thicker and thinner lithosphere here, I don't think are actually um, necessarily like robust constraints. Um, that is really what we're seeing right here. And you can tell, you know, picking a negative phase in some instances was, was difficult. Like we have a fairly continuous phase down here, which would agree with plate age, um, but it completely disappears over here. And then we have a negative phase right here, which is much shallower. And so because one of the kind of points we make in the papers, because the amplitudes on the Pacific side of the plate are so weak, we have a hard time properly constraining the depth of the LAB um, on the Pacific plate. Great, thank you. You have four additional questions already, okay. but okay. I think I want to switch over to Diego and his talk so that we have okay. time for everything and then we can um, ask these questions at the end or I think you have the ability to type the answer if you'd like to do that. Yeah. So, okay, great. As you would like, <laughs> we can always go <laughs> back to these questions. So, okay, sounds good. Um, all right. So, all right. Okay, so our second presenter today is Dr. Diego Melgar, an assistant professor of geophysics in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Oregon. His research focuses on large earthquakes. 
He works on the physics of the rupture process and how to best image it by using many diverse kinds of onshore and offshore geophysical data. He also research, researches the hazards associated with these large events, working on tsunami modeling and coastal impacts, as well as studying how strong shaking can be forecast. Diego was awarded the 2016 Charles Richter Early Career Award from the Seismological Society of America, and prior to joining the University of Oregon, spent three years at the University of California Berkeley Seismolab, working on early warning systems. He continues to work on how to abate the societal impact of earthquake hazards. Diego earned his Bachelor's of, bachelor's of Engineering in Geophysics from whoa, whoa, Universidad Nacional Autonoma de Mexico, sorry Diego, and his master's and PhD in geophysics from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. So without further ado, here's Dr. Melgar to talk about geodetic coupling at subduction megathrusts and tsunami hazards, an example from Cascadia. Thanks, Diego. Thanks, Danielle, for that kind introduction. And thanks, John, for the invitation to participate in this uh, virtual plenary. It's nice to see so many familiar names on the box here on the right. So even if I don't get to see you this year, um, I feel like we all still have some friends out there. So that's a good feeling. So today I'm going to talk about, um, continuing with this theme of the behavior across interfaces, I'm going to talk about my favorite interface, which is what happens when earthquakes interact with uh, the ocean and generate uh, tsunami waves. I'm going to be presenting mostly on David Small's uh, PhD work, so most of the credit for what I'm going to talk about here um, goes to him. And a lot of these ideas are born out of uh, collaborations with uh, Amy Williamson and Dara Goldberg, who are postdocs here at the UO and have since moved on to the USGS and NOAA, and with uh, Randy Levesque at the University of Washington, with whom I've been working on and off throughout the years. So the main issue that I'm going to discuss today is this picture that I'm sure many of you have seen to death at several talks. Here on the left are two candidate coupling models uh, for the Cascadia subduction zone. We don't actually know which one's correct. And what a coupling model shows with the uh, locking fraction, you'll see it sometimes as locking fraction, sometimes a slip deficit rate, we'll discuss that in a second. Zero coupling means that the subduction megathrust is creeping. So wherever you see blue, it means that this portion of the interface is probably creeping, is not accumulating slip. And wherever you see higher coupling, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, or 1.0, that means that the coupling is high and that the megathrust is locked. And if it's locked throughout the interseismic period, it's accumulating slip that can be used later uh, for a, with a co-seismic rupture. So conceptually, it's easy to think that shallow locking is bad news for, for tsunami hazards. This model on the right, which has basically complete locking all the way to the trench, um, we can understand that it probably means bad things for tsunamis. It means that there's a lot of slip available to be used in the next uh, big earthquake. But how do we, that's the point of this talk, how do we formally quantify just how bad um, that can be? Uh, in hazards research, uh, there's an approach that, to doing this, which is called probabilistic tsunami hazard analysis, PTHA. It's the brother or sister or sibling of PSHA. And this is, a, I don't know why this is a little bit blurry, but this is a PTHA map uh, for the Mexican subduction zone for regional tsunami hazards. And the goal of PTHA is to assign probabilistic estimates to certain things occurring. So in this map, for example, each one of these panels says for a tsunami amplitude of 0 0.5 meters, for example, here in the bottom, the probabilities of that tsunami occurring in a given period, these are the annual probabilities as 0.1 for this northern part of the subduction zone maybe all the way to 0.2 for the southern part of the subduction zone. If you raise the threshold to one and a half or three meters, three meters is a pretty catastrophic tsunami, um, those probabilities get lower because large earthquakes are less probable. Um, but depending also on the nature of the coastline and the bathymetry, those probabilities can change. Some places amplify tsunamis, others don't. The, these probabilistic estimates themselves have uncertainties. They reflect the knowledge that is put into them. We have to make assumptions. And one of the ways that we can reduce those uncertainties is by adding more knowledge, by doing research and convincing ourselves that that research is good enough to be added into a hazard um, estimate. And in the parlance of uh, probabilistic analysis, that means converting the aleatory uncertainty, the uncertainty about the things we know we don't know, and converting it into epistemic uh, uncertainty. And then hopefully also reducing that epistemic uncertainty. And one of the equations, main equations of PTHA, depending on what flavor of PTHA you use, this can change, but 
This is one of the main equations of PTHA that is going to be important for the purposes of this talk, and I'll walk you slowly through what this means. This here on the left is the goal. This is a statement about what is the probability that the tsunami, which we usually refer to by this letter eta, what is the probability that that exceeds a certain threshold eta sub c? And computing this number allows us to say things like there is a 2% chance that in 50 years at this location, the tsunami will exceed five meters. That's what we're after. These are the kinds of statements that can be used by engineers and city planners when laying out a port, for example. To compute this number, um, you need to know a few things. You need to know the likelihood of an earthquake of a certain magnitude, which we can perhaps obtain from a Gutenberg-Richter uh, distribution. We might know for some sub subduction zones um, how frequently magnitude 7s occur, how frequently magnitude 8s occur. For Cascadia, evidently, this is challenging, and I'm not going to focus on that, but I'm, I'm glad to talk about that um, later. You also need to make some assumption about the return period that is of interest to you. For structures, people typically look at a return period of 50 years, but that depends on you. And then the heart of the matter is this conditional probability. This conditional probability is stating, given that an earthquake of a certain magnitude has occurred, what is the probability um, of exceeding that threshold? And it is this conditional probability that makes, in my opinion, the probabilistic hazard assessments difficult, or this is the challenge. Now, what that conditional probability um, is trying to get at is, what is the potential variability of all tsunamis? Given that an earthquake of a certain magnitude has occurred, what range of values can we expect from earthquakes in that uh, given magnitude? Now, in order to understand and answer that question, we must uh, be clear about where that variability originates from. Why is it that earthquakes of the same magnitude produce a range of potential tsunamis? And I would argue that the largest source of uncertainty or the largest source of variability in these estimates is the earthquake source itself. In this animation, I'm showing a propagation model for the 2011 Tohokuoki earthquake. And what I want you to take away from this is that modeling propagation over known and complex bathymetry is no longer a difficult task. So the uncertainty in what the tsunami will be doesn't have to do with our inability to model the propagation. It has to do with our lack of knowledge of the earthquakes or of the future earthquake sources. That is the largest source um, of variability or uncertainty in the tsunami hazard assessments. So what, what can we do about it? The approach that we've taken and the approach that many have taken in the community in PTHA over the last 10 or 15 years or so is to use stochastic slip models um, to quantify or to try to get a, a hold on uh, that variability or that uncertainty. For the last five years or so, we, we've been developing this code called Fake Quakes, which is Python based, and you can grab it from GitHub. You can clone it down there with that link at the bottom. And Fake Quakes relies on the basic finding by Martin May and Greg Burroughs in 2002 that slip distributions can be conceived of as a stochastic, um, as a spatially uh, random field with quantifiable statistical properties. And that paper was proposed, and it remains uh, true to this day that uh, a von Karman correlation function seems to best describe. Uh, the, the statistical properties of slip and the, prop the statistical properties of that uh, von Karman correlation are magnitude dependent. For example, the correlation lengths that describe whether asperities um, are wider than they are uh, longer, um, those also depend on magnitude. Uh, Fake Quakes uses that but also is able to use a 3D fault geometry for this example on the right. We're using slab 2.0 to generate one particular realization of a magnitude 8.9. And importantly, it's efficient. Um, we've worked enough on the code that it's pretty easy to generate thousands to tens of thousands of these simulated ruptures with fairly modest computational resources. The way that code works or the flow is the user selects a target magnitude. You say, I want earthquakes in the magnitude range 7.8 to 9.5 for Cascadia, for example. And when the code generates one particular realization of a stochastic rupture for a given magnitude, it first determines the length and width. You have the, all the available subduction zone, but for a given magnitude, we actually use stochastic um, probabilistic scaling laws. Um, and what that means is that if you want to generate an 8.5, you will sometimes get a skinny and short 8.5. Sometimes you will get a very long 8.5, and oftentimes we build something in between. Because we know that even though earthquakes, earthquake dimensions scale, um, that scaling is not perfect. Sometimes you get earthquakes with slightly different dimensions. And then what is diff a little different about 
fig quakes is that we generate these stochastic distributions using uh, the KL expansion method first proposed by Randy um, Lebeck in his 2016 uh, Pure and Applied Geophysics uh, paper. So the KL expansion approach to generating stochastic ruptures um, conceptually is fairly straightforward. And this is it. This is the second equation that is important for this talk. S is a vector that contains the slip at all the subfaults in the model. S is the slip distribution. So S is everything that you see here in this map on the right. That is how much slip there is everywhere on the fault. In order to generate that stochastic slip distribution, um, we had to assume some mean model, some background state. And in the original KL expansion formulation, what that means is assume that there's enough homogeneous slip on this selected length and width of fault, enough slip to hit your target magnitude. So if you're trying to make a magnitude 8.9, put enough homogeneous slip on here to get that magnitude 8.9. Then uh, the meat of the matter or the stochastic bit comes from once you assume uh, some statistics or some correlation functions like the von Karman one, it's not the only one, you could assume Gaussian statistics, although that doesn't seem to work so well. Once you assume that, this has the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of that assumed statistical distribution. You then simply throw random numbers at the thing and that generates the statistical, the stochastic slip pattern with your desired um, statistical properties. So conceptually, it's pretty straightforward and that's what fake quakes does. Now, the question is, if we actually have estimates of fault locking, how can we use that to, how can we build that into the stochastic slip realizations? And that's what David's been working on. For those of you um, that are unfamiliar, um, here's a quick detour of how these locking models um, are made. They come from tectonic geodesy. Uh, decadal scale uh, velocities are estimated from GNSS. These are estimates of how fast the crust is moving, typically millimeters per year. Um, and this is the complex uh, interseismic velocity field for uh, the west coast of the US, this famous big swirl. And then the question is simply, assuming that the interior of North America is fixed, what are the block motions of each of these crustal blocks and what is the locking that is needed on the fault to explain uh, this complex velocity field? The answer, or one of the answers to that question, is the locking model um, itself. For Cascadia, there are several candidate locking models that have been proposed over the years. I will focus for the purposes of this talk just on these two as example end member models of uh, something that is not very locked at the trench and something that is very locked at the trench. And I'll refer to these as the Gauss uh, for the unlocked model or, port or less coupled model. And the gamma model, this nomenclature comes from the original paper from Gina Schmalzli and others in 2014. So we'll look at both of these models as candidate locking distributions. Now the modification or the way we include these um, into the stochastic slip generation is simply by modifying this mean slip model. Remember when we use the KL expansion, this is originally just enough homogeneous slip to hit the target magnitude um, that you're after. We simply modify that and say, let's actually use as the mean model or as the background model, heterogeneous slip that is based or taken from uh, the locking model itself. Here's an example of how that works. In this example, the user of the code has said, hey, I want a magnitude 8.6 earthquake. Fakequakes does its thing and estimates roughly how, lo how long and how wide magnitude 8.6 earthquakes are and from the entire subduction zone model picks out a length of fault um, with proper dimensions. It then takes the locking model and says, rescales that uh, locking model to enough slip to hit that target magnitude, but it mimics completely the locking pattern um, of the locking model. And then you simply apply the KL expansion and you generate as many stochastic realizations as you want. So here are eight stochastic realizations um, on the right. And the main takeaway is that by doing this, we are not forcing the stochastic realizations to match perfectly uh, what we think is in the locking model, but by changing this background mean model, what we're saying is overall, we want, you to, uh, we want to make slip on the highly locked patches more possible or more common or more likely than slip on the unlocked patches. So here, is, uh, here are eight realizations for the gamma model. And if I flip over to the Gauss model, and if I just flip between them, you can see that indeed what Fakequakes is doing is, for example, for the Gauss model, it's frequently placing more slip on this uh, mid uh, 20 kilometer depth asperity. Um, but that doesn't mean that shallow slip doesn't occur. It will still occur even in these uh, patches with low coupling, it'll just be less frequent. So if I flip between them, we'll see more frequent shallow slip because the mega thrust is assumed lock here. But in the patches here with low coupling, less frequent slip. 
So that's exactly what we want. We want to produce slip models that have more, more slip more frequently where the fault is locked. And then what we do is we simply generate tsunamis for all of these um, stochastic realizations. For each assumed locking model, we generate a few thousand ruptures in the magnitude range 7.8 to 9.2, calculate the co-seismic deformation of the sea floor, and forward propagate um, a tsunami to the coastline and simply track what the tsunami amplitudes are everywhere along the coast. Here's a, an example of what that looks like for two of these uh, stochastic realizations in 8.3, showing the coastal amplitudes here on the left going from zero to two meters. And for a 9.1, the coastal amplitudes going from zero to a very, very catastrophic uh, 10 meters in the northern part of the subduction zone. But we actually have thousands of these. So what this is synthesizing is the expected uh, coastal amplitudes for different families of earthquakes, depending on whether we assume the gamma locking the Gaussian locking, which has less locking at the trench, or whether we didn't make any assumptions about locking at all. And this is showing as a function of latitude, what are the expected coastal amplitudes for each of these. For the smaller, um, for the smaller magnitudes, there's not a big effect, but once you get to the large magnitudes, you'll see, for example, that the gamma locking model for the northern part of the subduction zone has a much broader distribution of possible amplitudes with more extreme uh, tsunamis here in the north. And it's easy to understand why that is. If you compare the locking, it is here in the north where the locking is highest uh, or is, has the largest difference between the gamma and the Gauss locking models. And that is manifested here in the tsunami amplitudes themselves. The other important point is that in doing so and having thousands of simulations at each point, what we've effectively done with these violin plots is we've estimated this conditional probability at least empirically. Each of these little violins is this conditional probability for earthquakes of a certain magnitude at a certain point along the coastline. So if we make some assumptions about the Gutenberg-Richter distribution of Cascadia, which are just that assumptions, we can fill in the rest of this equation and properly or formally estimate the probabilistic tsunami hazard for each of those points along the coast. And when we do so, we obtain what might be familiar to a lot of you, which are hazard curves. So these hazard curves are these probabilistic estimates of how likely are you to exceed certain tsunami thresholds. This uh, what x axis eta is the tsunami amplitude. And what these curves are saying is, for example, the probability, these are annual probabilities, the probability of exceeding one meter at this location, 41 degrees north, that probability is roughly about 0.7 or 0.8 um, at that point of the coastline. And what this is showing is the different probabilities depending on whether you did not assume any locking at all or whether you made some assumptions about the locking model. And just like we saw in the violin plots, as you march north, uh, you see that the gamma model, the one with the shallow locking, really begins to separate and shows alarmingly much higher expected tsunami amplitudes for the northern chunks of the coastline. What you can also do is you can convert these tsunami hazard curves to tsunami hazard maps, which is shown here um, on the right. And to do so, you pick a return period and you pick a threshold. What David has done here is he's asked, what, is the, what are the amplitudes that are likely to be exceeded at a 2% level every 50 years? These are common uh, numbers when doing PTHA or PSHA. And what this map reflects is, for example, these red dots have a probability of exceeding 14, 15 meter tsunamis, um, have a 2% probability of exceeding that level every 50 years. So these are the hazard maps for the gamma locking model, the Gaussian locking model, and the no locking assumed. And as expected, where the locking was high here in the Olympic Peninsula and in parts of uh, British Columbia, um, this is very, very red. This is a comparison between the gamma, Gaussian, and no model, and it shows exactly the same thing. What's important here is that it didn't really matter whether you assumed the gamma or the Gaussian locking model, um, the estimates are uniformly higher than when you made no assumptions about locking at all. That's my dog. So why are these uh, differences uh, between, the tsunami, between the different assumptions um, so stark? It's easy to explain simply because we made them happen. We conditioned the stochastic slip ruptures to have more slip in certain places. So what you're seeing here is if you take different profiles across the subduction zone and you look at the mean slip for all magnitude nine events, depending on what locking model you assumed or whether you assumed no locking, you see that as designed here in the north, the gamma um, locking model produces on average a lot more shallow slip and as a result will produce on average much larger tsunamis. 
So stochastic rupture and, and stochastic rupture modeling and tsunami propagation codes are very mature now and efficient enough to generate tens of thousands of tsunami runs for any subduction zone. The main takeaway of this talk is that conditioning the ruptures with an underlying uh, locking model can drastically alter the inferred hazard. And in both cases, um, the assumed locking model produced hazard estimates that are uniformly higher than when you make no assumptions um, about locking. Evidently, if you are uncertain about which locking model is correct, you can still uh, take advantage of some formalisms like logic trees or decision trees to combine uh, the estimates from different locking models. And we also recognize that in this particular example or test case, we have ignored other tsunami sources. We don't have splay faulting in the mega thrust. We haven't looked at outer rise uh, normal faulting, landslide sources, or anything like that. So what I've shown you here is not meant to be an authoritative uh, assessment of what tsunami hazards are likely to be um, in the Cascadia subduction zone. But what we're trying to do is provide a formalism for introducing this new knowledge of uh, locking or coupling at the mega thrust into the PTHA estimate right now because it's not currently possible to take a detailed map of, of locking and include it in PTHA. The other important point is that obviously we do not know at present the nature of offshore locking. We don't know which one of these competing models is correct. And part of the difference is that if you look at the interseismic velocity field on the surface of the crust produced by both of these locking models that's shown here on the right, they look the same. We simply cannot tell apart the Gaussian and the gamma locking model by looking just at onshore um, tectonic geodesy. So what this is meant to do is to motivate the fact that really the only way we're going to answer questions like this one, and I know a lot of you know this, and I know we beat this horse dead, um, we really need seafloor geodesy uh, to answer these questions. There's a few seafloor geodetic uh, velocity measurements already made. These blue arrows exist today. And just from these blue arrows, it's looking pretty locked to me. The fact that these seafloor stations are marching towards North America suggests that the gamma locking model is more likely than the Gaussian locking model. But just from these few points, we really can't tell. So we need a more concerted effort to go offshore um, and figure that out. So I'll stop here. This is a picture of Florence where I spend a lot of time. And I'm sure the residents of Florence would really like to know which of the locking models is correct. Um, thank you, Danielle. I'll take questions if there's time. Great. Yes, thank you, Diego. Um, Amir Salary writes, um, Diego, thanks for a great talk. Is smoothing applied to the fake quake slip distribution? If yes, have you quantified the effect of the extent of smoothing on tsunami generation slash propagation? There's no, there's no smoothing applied to the stochastic slip realizations, at least not directly. There is, of course, some smoothing introduced by virtue of choosing the size of the subfaults. If you choose very teeny tiny subfaults, you'll get a more uh, granular distribution of slip. Um, we haven't done this, but a lot of people have looked at this in the past. And the nice thing about tsunamis is that we can use chunkier, bigger um, subfaults. If we were to use the same technique for a strong motion simulation, we need to go down from what we currently have, which is about 10 kilometer, 10 or 15 kilometer big subfaults. We have to go down to like one kilometer or 500 meter subfaults, which increases computation time, um, but it is still possible. Um, but no, there's no smoothing in the slip realizations. Okay, great. Um, we had an anonymous question. Um, are you able to take into account rupture directivity or are the models assuming instantaneous rupture and just computing the tsunami height? Um, we can do it. Um, GeoClaw uh, can take advantage of, you can have a time varying uh, deformation of the seafloor. Amy Williamson, um, who was a postdoc with me and has now moved to NOAA, uh, conducted a study in JGR in 2019, where we found that rupture speed has a very, very, very tiny effect in near field tsunami hazards. Um, I'll direct you to her paper in 2019. The effect is something like a couple of percent in the amplitudes. In the far field, um, whether the rupture is bilateral or unilateral can have an effect in rotating the energy in a specific direction. But right next to the earthquake, whether you consider it an instantaneous source or whether you take into account the actual duration and rupture speed of the source has a very small effect, simply because tsunami propagation is much, much slower than rupture speed. In certain special cases where the rupture speed is very, 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 very slow, it could potentially have an effect, but those very slow rupturing earthquakes, like tsunami earthquakes, are typically also very compact, so it's likely not um, a big effect. So we've neglected it for this particular study, but we can take into account if we were to be convinced that it was important. Great. Um, 
so there's a question that I might try to combine just for the sake of time a little bit, but um, can you introduce time dependence into the P PTHA? Um, like, is it more likely to have a big tsunami than a hundred years ago? Um, and I think part of that question is maybe the challenge is to figure out true locking. Um, yeah. Even if the shallowest part of the fault is not mechanically locked, it may not be slipping because of stress shadowing and thus appears to be locked, uh, i.e. slip deficit is not locking. Yeah, I, I, I agree. We've made the assumption, um, the critical assumption here is that high locking equals a large slip deficit available for, for the next earthquake. And that is an assumption that is more defensible for some parts of the subduction zone. Um, so yeah, that assumption is built in and if there, we could relax it, we can precondition the ruptures to be whatever you want. And the stochastic slip realizations will, will produce slip more frequently in some places than others. We haven't done that here. As to the time dependence question, that is a very tricky thing. Um, in PSHA, the USERF model that is very famous, the California uh, PSHA model, its first, um, if it's, well, its last iteration, public iteration, did not consider time dependence. And then its new version is trying to consider um, the time dependence of seismic hazard. It's a, we, we, I have no idea how to even begin to tackle this problem, I guess I'll say. Um, especially for a place like Cascadia that is slightly quirky, um, where even things like a Gutenberg-Richter distribution don't really make that much sense. Where are all the eights and where are all the sevens, um, for example? So I guess I'd have to go read about the time-dependent USERF model for inspiration as to how we would take that into account in Cascadia. It's definitely a very, very, very tricky problem. Great, thank you, Diego. There's quite a few more questions. Heather has been great about answering her questions in the chat. Heather, I don't know if there's anything that you also wanted to answer live at all, but if you asked Heather a question, she's been great about putting them in uh, the answered questions. So look for your- Yeah, I think I, think I, I answered each of those. Um, the, only, the only one that I couldn't really fully, I, I, I gave references where possible. Okay. <laughs> uh, including the, the, sections of, <laughs> the sections of the paper. Um, the only thing that I wanted to maybe really quickly comment on is somebody asked about mm -hmm. the, and I'm going to pull up a different talk if I can find it in like the next two seconds, if not. Um, okay. Um, so somebody asked about the density of stations across the plate boundary and if that could have had an effect on um, the, the results. And so I'm just going to quickly share. I think that's the wrong one. This one. Okay. Um, so this is a, just a map again of the station density. And um, we can see here like uh, really the highest concentration of, of stations is in Southern California, um, which actually falls on the, the, the western half of the plate boundary because that's where the population density is also the highest, um, coincidentally. But that we see really relative, you know, uniform coverage on either side of the plate boundary, um, at least onshore. Once we get offshore, we kind of lose you know, any sort of coverage. Um, but the fact that the, the way that receiver functions um, are calculated and the fact that the, the seismic waves that we're using are fairly, they travel fairly obliquely to the surface as they get close to the stations means that we have good coverage offshore. And so this map right here is showing us the, the coverage at a depth of 70 kilometers. And the red colors correspond to just like way, like it just, we have more coverage than we need. And anything um, that falls within this white line um, is coverage feel confident in, in making a, an interpretation from. So that's what I just wanted to show those figures. Really no, quickly. that's great. That's yeah. great. And yeah, I mean, if it's not obvious right now, I'm trying to open it up to both speakers if there's any questions. Um, and Diego, I think, is starting to answer some questions in the Q&A. Thank you for doing that as well. Um, Heather, while we have you, uh, Luciana asks, um, from the topography map of the LAV depth, it seems that the LAV depth is very variable be beneath the Pacific plate. Could yeah. Possible cause of the lower amplitude of the S. Yeah. The LAV, <laughs> I think, P phase. <laughs> yeah. So I, I answered a variation of the question in the chat box, but I'll, I'll share the screen again um, and explain. So it actually turns out it's probably the other way around that the the variation in the depth of the LAB phase beneath the Pacific plate is the result of the incredibly weak signal that we get in terms of like the strength of the LAB phase. And so we have a really hard time picking a re reliable LAB phase there. Um, 
I mean, you can kind of think about it, like, you know, when we pick on the North American plate, it's like super clear and obvious. We're like, that's it, that's it, that's it. When we get to the Pacific plate, we're like, well, you know, maybe we could kind of discontinue with whatever, if you look at the Pacific plate side, between like 100 and 300 kilometers. There's a weak phase at 80, but there's a really kind of maybe weak phase at 40 and 50. So it's, it's it was difficult to pick those phases. And so I don't have a lot of confidence in the depths of the LAB on the Pacific plate side because the amplitudes are so weak. Okay, great. All right, Diego, Heather, any last thoughts, any last wrap ups? I see there's one kind of outstanding question, Diego, I don't know if you were working on. <laughs> I'm, type, I'm typing the answer out. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so thank you. Um, any last thoughts or wrap up that you wanna leave? Anyway? Yes. I want to say thank you for for hosting this webinar series and I'm looking forward to seeing more webinars in the future and sure. you know seeing people at some point great yeah. yes I know right seeing people at some point would be great so yeah. um uh, so, of course, we want to thank you, NAVCO, and specifically Beth Pratsatala for organizing the Gage Sage workshop um, that will take place, uh, hopefully in person next August in Breckenridge, um, and for UNAVCO's suggestion to bring these plenary sessions online. Uh, the next webinar for the Gage Sage plenary sessions will take place at 2 p.m. Eastern on Thursday, October 22nd. The plenary session is New Approaches to Processing Big Geophysical and Geospatial Data Sets. And the presenters are Dr. Michael Olson at Oregon State University and Dr. Lindsay Hagee at the University of California at Berkeley. And so we look forward to seeing you all back then. And um, we will have the video uh, available on our IRIS Earthquake Science YouTube channel as soon as we possibly can do so, probably, you know, uh, latest by, by tomorrow evening. So stay tuned for that. I saw that there was a question about that. And uh, yes, thank you, a big thank you to both Heather and Diego for bringing their plenary talks online on Zoom, which I think we're all spending our lives on these days. <laughs> so um, thanks everybody, I appreciate it. All right, take care. Hi, Danielle. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.